the Know Your Gear podcast. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to the non your non your gear, the non your gear podcast, episode three hundred thirty five. So this week I get the episode right, just the title of the show wrong. But you know what? I think there's an improvement somewhere in there, so we'll go with it. Uh, anyways, it's the none of your gear podcast. Podcast, you like your none your business podcast. Uh, so anyways, I hope everybody's having a great week. Uh, my week has been good. It's busy. Busy is good. And uh, and uh, so we'll start with that. We have a lot of questions and comment subjects that were sent in all week through the uh, website, which is the knowyourgearpodcast.com website. And uh, before we uh, start, I should start with something fun. Let's start with something fun. Um, we are back to giving away snarks. That's right. We're giving away two packs of snarks. They're well, we made two snarks together, so I guess it's a two-pack. Um, there's a link in the description down below to enter. We're going to be picking uh, five sets of two, so everybody gets two snarks plus a Know Your Gear pick and sticker. And um, uh, my amazing wife will package this all up and ship this to you. As always, no one will contact you through social media. No one will ask you for anything, uh, no money, nothing like that ever. And uh, that's why we do it through our website. You go right to our website so we know where you're going. And the only thing you give when you sign up for the contest is your email address. Now, real quick, somebody mentioned that through the uh, system we use, sometimes they spam you on a list or something. That's because we weren't paying for the service. I am in the process of paying for the service so that they don't do that because that's how, you know, um, but I wanted to try the service before I started paying for it. So I'll start paying for it. And then therefore it won't send you any emails or anything as far as I know, at least that's the way I understand it. So like I said, if you want to enter two rechargeable snarks, these are the new ones that are rechargeable. They come with a USB cable. They're ready to go out of the box, start tuning. And of course, uh, you can recharge them up and, uh, maybe stick a, a new year gear sticker on them. I don't think so, but you can always do that too. So like I said, I, I like doing that. You guys seem to like the contest. We've been doing really good stuff. So real quick. Also, let's make a big announcement because I actually, I have, we have a winner of the Paul Reed Smith, uh, uh SE, uh, swamp ash special swamp ash special. Got to hit that a H hard swamp ash <laughs> special. Uh, it was, uh, Giuseppe Storms won it. Uh, so, uh, I've confirmed his address and everything. So he's, uh, we're shipping it out to him. So Giuseppe, uh, congratulations on that. And, uh, I'm excited. So like I said, you guys seem to really like the giveaways and, um, we like doing them and, uh, we're lucky enough, uh, to, to figure out how to get it done. <laughs> it's, it's the best way to put that, right? It's a little tricky sometimes. Okay. So let's uh, let's get into a couple things. First, uh, I'm going to grab some some comments. Grabbing one right now from somebody. So um, if I miss your comment, repost it again. There are moderators, and in one second, as soon as I open up my other screen, because you know you know you know there's never enough screens, uh, the moderators can also send me stuff too if there's something. That I'm missing. Okay, let's start with some questions that came in uh, uh, early risers and throughout the week. The first one was thoughts on the new Universal Audio FX uh, FX Lion pedal. Any plans to check it out? Um, my understanding is probably like some of you guys that saw the videos. Uh, Universal Audio, who's made a really amazing 65 Deluxe Reverb pedal, and uh, and a Vox pedal is now making a Marshall pedal. That's my. I don't know what Marshall it is. I didn't get past any thumbnails, so all I saw was Marshall in a box. You know, kind of pedals. Uh, videos. Uh, I've, uh, so I thought, you know, Hey, if they did the other ones really well, this one will probably be done really well. I like UA stuff. My aux is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, like, you know, when you think of like five pieces of gear, I couldn't live without right now. The aux is one of those things for sure. It's definitely in the five. So that's pretty, pretty impressive. That all being said, would I have any plans? To do I have any plans to check it out? No, they don't really, uh, send me any gear to check out on the channel. And, uh, I have no interest in buying a, a Marshall type pedal, even if it's the best one, because I have some Marshall pedals that are really cool. And, you know, there's just nothing, nothing there for me to, to grab. So sadly enough, if, if it's not something on my radar to buy for myself personally, or something you guys are just kind of always, you know, talking about, uh, I don't have any interest to check it out. And, you know, um, and to be honest, even if they contacted me right now, I mean, I'm, I was finishing content today that's posting in December. <laughs> I mean, so you know what I mean? We're, 
We're like literally out of wise. Um, okay, so what else? Next question. Uh, let's see. I don't know what that one is. What is this question? What is this? Oh, okay. So this is an interesting question uh, because it's a, it's about pickups and it's something that happened. So uh, this is Dr. JB <laughs> uh, sent me a message saying that he has a stock Gibson S1 he purchased in 1977. Uh, it has three single coil pickups. The B and E strings have very low volume. He adjusted the pickup so that it that it can fit a dime underneath it. So in other words, he's slamming the pickup right up again, underneath the pickup. Uh, slamming the pickup right underneath the string. Sorry about that. <laughs> you got to keep your brain in check. Um, and he's saying the problem is, is that the B and E strings have very low volume. He adjusted the pickup. We talked about that. And he says, uh, this helps some, but not totally fix the problem. When he was adjusting the pickup, he noticed that the bridge pickup was magnetic and the other two were not. Should the pickups be magnetic? Uh, what could what could be causing the low volume in those strings? Is there any problems? So to, let's break this down to quite two answers. One, first, the pickup should be magnetic. Uh, pickups uh, can be demagnetized. Uh, it happens, right? Magnets can be magnetized and demagnetized. That's how it works. It's not easy to do in a lot of cases, especially with guitar pickups, but it has been known to happen. Um, Eddie Van Halen famously was demagnetizing a pickup with using the drill. Uh, so, you know, that's a true story. So, you know, uh, uh, DiMaggio Pickups owns a or has a patent on the pickup that's in the Access guitar to this day. Um, and that pick that patent is for uh, putting a space between where the magnets and the pull pieces are the, and the slugs and the screws touch to make like a buffer. Um, and again, I'm just trying to remember what I read on the patent. It makes a buffer or space so that basically it would stop demagnetizing with this drill. Funny, funny story. It's one of those stories you hear all the time in rock uh, industry, rock, you know, history. And you're like, ah, I don't know. Is it a wives tale? Who knows? But hey, it led to a them actually having to redesign a pickup and make a patent. So I'm going to say it's probably true, <laughs> right? Um, so in your case, uh, yes, it, it could happen. So, you know, um, the second pickup I ever made in my life was probably about 2003, and 2004 somewhere no 2003 and the second pickup i ever made um i messed up and for some reason two of the poles weren't magnetized on a single coil pickup and that's exactly what happened <laughs> i put it in the guitar and all of a sudden i was like i think in my case it was the g and the b string like there were just there was nothing going on i was like and you can kind of hear them and the reason you can kind of hear your strings so you know uh, jb dr jb sorry dr jb uh is that um because the other pole pieces are working they're going to they're, the magnetic fields are going to get, you know, this, the movement of, that, movement of that string. So there won't be flat, no sound, unless the entire pickup is entirely demagnetized. Um, so uh, that can be fixed. So with a 1977 era, era guitar, I would have them fixed. You can, you can fix pickups like that. Um, I don't do that. And a lot of people I know that make pickups don't do that. But a lot of repair shops, especially quality ones throughout the U.S., will do stuff like that. And uh, that's something you can do. And you don't even have to really send the guitar. That's something you can pull out your pickups and send them to a competent person and they can fix your pickups. Now, I don't know everything that's going on with those pickups. So, you know, you also understand that when they get them, they could find other problems than what I'm just suggesting is a problem. So, yeah, that sounds like what the problem is, especially since you're saying that the they're not magnetized. There's no magnetic pull on them. So there you go. So that is the answer. It can happen. It sucks. Um, yeah. Um, what else? It's also why I told you guys I keep all my collection of pickups in those little tubes. And everybody's like, what is with those tubes? And it's just because, um, it's not, I'm afraid to, to demagnetize pickups. You can just mess up some of the, <laughs> the magnets. Um, it's not very uh, common and it's not very easy, but it can't happen. Okay. Uh, but let's see the what else Fa, hi phil new guitar day early christmas present a 2007 dean hardtail beautiful tiger's eye finish tiger's eye is one of my favorite finishes uh mark Tremonti had a tiger's eye finish prs i always wanted a tiger's eye and every time i talked to prs they're like we only do that for like the private stocks and i was like Ugh, of course anyways <laughs> uh, he goes he bought it off reverb he can't tell if it's a, a select or a standard he doesn't have it yet um, but he should get in a week or so. So he, that's not the question. He just wanted to share a new guitar day. Now he has a question. The question is, uh, it was very affordable 
And I see that over reverb, over, you know, when you're looking over reverb as a whole, the, the website, the Dean guitars are usually listed for months. And he goes, why no love for them? Um, are they bad quality? Do they sound bad relative to other brands? I'm making a big, ch am I taking a big chance in this? So, um, and he says, thanks. So let me give you the answer. There, there's nothing wrong with those guitars. Most likely a lot of those Dean guitars are made in the same factories that the other brands are made, especially if they're import Deans. Dean Guitars, obviously, is having all kinds of troubles now as a company with all kinds of issues, but that's not a, an issue. That's not hurting the guitars. If your question is why the resale value is down on Dean, um, you could say, well, maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe the quality is bad. But the reason you're saying they're not selling, you, know, you notice they sit for a long period of time, it's because no one's actively trying to buy them. And the reason is, is because there's not a lot of Dean advertising. You know, um, people like to think, of themselves as unique, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we all do it. We're like, I'm so unique, <laughs> but we're not. And we like to think that we have original thoughts and ideas. And for the most part, we don't. And more importantly, we like to think that we're not subject to influence and in advertising. And we absolutely are. And to me, I can tell you if I was to go through my reverb affiliate links, my, uh, uh, Sweetwater affiliate links, all uh, guitar center affiliate links, all the affiliate links, there's so many of them, Amazon, um, it is without a doubt, <laughs> I can tell you right now, if I see all of a sudden an uptick, and it has nothing to do with me, okay? I'm not even talking about me. If all of a sudden I see an uptick and I go, man, all of a sudden, everybody's buying uni universal audio stuff, whoa. And then I go, hmm, I wonder. And then I go on YouTube and I go, universal audio, boom. And then the list of YouTubers down the road and all the new universal auto product product. It's literally that easy. So, uh, Dean is one of those companies that is not co uh, constantly promoting. Um, and the, uh, the other issue with Dean is, um, they're really focused in the mom and pop segment and the mom and pop segment, uh, you know, is a much smaller segment than the big, you know, big muscle online giants. And so therefore the advertising again is very low. So it's just an, it's just low advertising. Dead, the good news for you is I think they make good stuff. Um, you know, Dean is no different than most of the companies that are out there. There's a couple models that are not going to be very good because they're made to be inexpensive and cheap. And there's a lot of models that are fantastic. Um, there it is. And here's a good example. And I, I like to put this. Wendell put, I don't like the way most Deans look, so I wouldn't be buying one. Now, Wendell, thank you for making that comment because that is a factor in, you know, the aesthetics, right? Take this Rickenbacker behind me versus like that Schecter, right? That's two different people totally. And then of course, just this, this uh, reissue Strat, the 60s reissue Strat. So three totally different customer bases. However, this is my point, right? Dean, uh, like a lot of companies, they, you know, if you, re if you remember most of the guitars that you like, you probably didn't like or think of until somebody just kept putting them in your face, whether that be a rock star or, uh, you know, ads in the guitar world magazines back in the day, or YouTubers now, or, you know, Instagrammers, or your favorite music store, um, or your local musician, or your older brother or sister, right? There's just something that's going to start that momentum. And that's the whole point. Um, and so that's your answer to your question. So there you go. Um, let's see. I want to jump this one. This is about the Delos. I want to hold off on that. Um, okay. Or do I want to hack? I don't know. The other ones look even crazier. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, um, okay. Uh, here's an easy one and then I'll go to a hard one. Okay. So here's an easy one. This one's easy. Uh, this one's comes from a, uh, from Curtis who says, what do you think the closest relatively available pickup to the black stock Northern lights pickup would be? Um, and he says, can I assume it's an El Nico 5 magnet? It can be because there, there's there, you can make pickups with an El Nico 5 or an El Nico 2. And then obviously, like I said, I, I generally go off the rule that the, the higher the number on the El Nico or on the ceramic number, the brighter the pickup gets. So a 2 is darker sounding than a 5, but it's only one part of an equation. So there's things that factor in. Um, if I was going to say what pickup well i can just tell you so the, i told you i've told you guys this before i did not i made the copper heads right the copper head pickups that i make uh made um they're my design um the northern lights is not my design it's someone else's design who stopped making it and a long time ago i just wanted them so i asked him to show me 
and he showed me how to do it and I started making them. Okay. And, uh, so that's where they came from. Now, interestingly enough, um, what are they closest to? Well, any kind of PAF style pickup, but definitely early sixties PAF style pickups more so than the fifties era pickups. Um, so if I was going to say, if you were looking for a pickup, that's going to kind of be that same thing, like what I would consider that same thing, what I'm using, I would say something like, um, the Ron Ellis sixties Betty, right? Something like that. That would be a pickup, uh, that would, that to me is what I'm referencing sometimes for that pickup when it comes to, uh, you know, what you're shooting for as a sound. So there you go. It's not a clone of that pickup, um, because I've never reverse engineered that pickup, but I have guitars with that pickup and my pickup and they're very similar. So, and other pickups, <laughs> they're all very similar. Cause again, it's just trying to recapture, capture that time frame of pickups, not that exact pickup. Okay. There you go. Um, this one was really fun. I just wanted to say this really cool. Uh, uh, Steve Wright sent a message. He said that he's not going to be here today for the live show, but he wanted to send me a message. He sent me a picture of his Delos, uh, the copper penny Delos. He bought the very first production one. Uh, he sent me a picture, which is really, really cool. Like I always say, you guys, if you buy a shirt, if you buy, uh, you know, the guitar stand, if you buy a Delos, uh, if you buy uh, Badlands, if you buy anything that I'm associated with in any way, um, send me a picture. Like I said, if you don't want it posted on a video, cause I post them on videos and stuff, that's fine. Just put that you don't want posted. Um, but I love seeing that stuff. It's like, it really can just really kind of spark the day up. It's really fun to see the, you know, that, that aspect and you never know. I sometimes get really nice and all of a sudden I'll be like, that's really cool. And then I, next thing I know, uh, the wife's on marching orders to do something cool. So that's what's happening today, by the way, for, uh, St uh Steve, uh, Steve, you bought, he, he put in this comment, I just want to put what he put. He says, uh, okay, Phil, uh, you did a great job picking the specs on this model. Very versatile. The finish is gorgeous. I like, I liked it before in person, but even more uh, incredible in person. Uh, it makes a, a good set to go with my Aries because he's got an Aries as well. Uh, this thing is set up better than any other guitar I ever played. That's a little bit of a cheat. Um, P uh, obviously Kiesel does a fantastic setup job, but obviously I was playing it for the thing. So we were also, you know, they were making it great for me. <laughs> so I'm sure all the guitars play great, but that one, like I said, was extra great. Um, so, um, I hope they all like that, but yours might be just a little bit tweaked a little bit better, um, for adjustment. Um, uh, let's see. He basically, what he says, he says, you're right. Uh, he, uh, he says, I got a good one. Cause I mentioned in that video when I was with Kiesel that this one was fantastic. It is a little bit lighter than mine and more resonant than mine. And, uh, and the neck had just a little bit more shoulder than mine, which I actually liked. It just felt a little bit better. So what's funny was, uh, what, um, we're going to send you something. That's what I wanted to just tell you. Uh, we're going to send you a thank you card with some swag and, uh, Shauna is going to make you a certificate. So your question, his question in this was technically, is this the first, uh, PM Delos ever made? Yes. So, uh, tech of, of announcing the production or the, you know, that they're assigning it a, a SKU number to me. Yes. That would be, you have the very first one of that. So mine would not be considered this. So, you know, mine's pre that and anyone who bought one before yours is pre that. So yours was the first. And so what we're going to do is going to send you a certificate that says that it's the first one of the assigned, you know, to the PM, uh, Delos naming structure. And also that it was the one I was holding in that video and stuff. And then we'll send you some swag and stuff. So Steve, uh, Shauna will take care of that. I just want to say thank you. And I'm doing that not because you bought the first guitar, because you were nice enough to send me a picture of it and say some nice things. Like I said, I really like those pictures. They're really cool. So thank you guys. Anytime you want to send that stuff, you never know. Uh, I not guarantee anything, but you never know when I'm in the mood to say something, you know, and do something for you guys. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's get into some, what you guys are talking about. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> uh, 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 my knees hurt says what goes into making a pickup other than magnet and wire and the number of wraps. Does anyone do pickups with more than one type of wire in the same pickup? Um, so there are, I heard once there's like three to 400 different possible combinations to do a pickup. I don't even want to go down that road. It's, it's, uh, enough to make me crazy. Let me just tell you what goes into what I, what I can vary a pickup with just downstairs in the shop. Um, 
yes, how many wraps, how many winds the pickup has is a factor. Uh, the type of magnet is a factor and how strong we magnetize that magnet. So, you know, I learned uh, a long time ago to use a different system to magnetize my magnets. Um, I cheated. <laughs> I did what a lot of people do. I was watching a video from a long time ago, back when YouTube had grainy, crappy videos, <laughs> right? And I saw in a shop that I really admire, they had a, a, a special machine that was magnetizing it and I froze it and, and it took forever. You know, I tried, I, I feel like hundreds of different names on the side of the machine until I could figure out what that machine was. So um, there's different ways. I, I like to, so basically it's more consistent in how you can magnetize the magnet is what I like. So yes, so not only the magnet type, but how strong or how weak you're magnetizing that magnet is a factor in the pickup. The thickness of the wire, so 42, 43, 44 gauge, so on, it keeps going and down in, in every direction, uh, can be a factor. The type of wire, whether it's enamel or it's farm varve or whatever, right? You know, different wire can be, you know, hey, silver, if you're Seymour Duncan, you're doing silver pickups. So there are a ton of variables, right? But there is some uh, some things that are more important. Well, and like I said, whether or not you add plates or the type of, and we said type of magnets, but I'm not shape of the magnet. Uh, so, you know, one of my uh, favorite pickups is from uh, DiMaggio, and I'm having trouble figuring, remembering the name, the Fortitude. The Fortitude pickup is a slightly over, in my opinion, slightly overwound PAF style pickup. However, if you have a Fortitude or a <laughs> right pickup, then you know this, that on the top it looks normal, but when you flip it upside down, the screws are um, at least twice as thick as the normal screws that come in a humbucker pickup. And believe it or not, that changes the, ma the magnetic field and changes the resonant peak. Right. So, I mean, so think about that. So that's another factor, the type, whether you're not using a slug, whether you're not using a screw, whether you're not using an Allen screw, whether or not, right, you're using multiple screws on sometimes or a blade. So there's a, there's, like I said, it just gets crazy and crazy and crazy. But this, uh, cause you know, I like food analogies. This is like some also comparing like a chili cook off thing, right? Um, there's a thousand ways to make chili. Uh, my, my wife will put sweet potatoes in the chili cause I, I like it, not yams, but sweet potatoes. Um, but, um, but, uh, so I don't put crackers in it. <laughs> uh, cause you know, I, I grew up and you put crackers in your chili. And so, um, so my wife doesn't uh, eat crackers. So she's like, she puts sweet potatoes in it. So my point is there's different variables that you can do stuff. And, but ultimately, if you were to go to a chili cook-off and have 20 kinds of chili, you would say most of them are close. They're just slightly different. Same pickups. Most of them are close. They're just slightly different. But there is a lot of variables that can make you crazy. Tone screws. Susan said tone screws. It's really that, it's that funny, but it's true. How, how long? <laughs> they are. Like I said, it can get, it gets uh nuts <laughs> so <laughs> brian says potatoes and chili it's sweet potatoes this is important you need to google the sweet potatoes it's like a different like uh just trust me okay um it's uh it's a different than potatoes <laughs> i uh i don't cook my wife cooks she's explained it to me i just know it's different i think it's like they have protein in them or something there's something about them that's different so it's really cool all right um <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to go on to next. Where are we going to go on to next? We're going to have some fun. Let's have some fun for a second. This is going to be, uh, <laughs> I got a gazillion emails about this, of course, uh, about what, what did I think? What did I, no one cares what I think. What did I think? Did I see? Did I know? The Rolling Stones magazine, 250 best guitar players. So I had no idea this existed. And then I got all these, uh, gazillion, um, uh, emails. And then of course I watched Beato's take. I watched somebody really uh, an interesting YouTube channel that I forgot. And I'll put in the, I'll put a link to him, uh, uh, where he went through the 50 they missed. Right. First, I just want to say, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go with it cause I think it's a fun subject, but I want to start with first, I could give a rat's ass what Rolling Stones magazine thinks a good guitar player is. I care about them as much as I care about Maxim magazine to me. If Maxim magazine went 50 of the best guitar players ever. I wouldn't care what they think either. Rolling Stone magazine, I have nothing against them, but I've never purchased a Rolling Stone magazine in my life. And most of the time, other than they put their, their Rolling Stone magazine's names, like the band, the Rolling Stones, and they seem to have a rock vibe to them. I've never really considered them a music magazine almost. And more importantly, I don't think, uh, 
you know, one, I'm not a real big fan of best lists anyways. Um, it's not very quantifiable, you know. Um, I've done some lists, as you know, like products and stuff and kind of give you some thoughts. But the other reason I want to tell you this, and then I like I said, I promise to have fun with it for a second, but I just want to get this out because this is the important part. But you understand, I just want to make sure because I don't know how many of you are hanging out right now. There's there's 911 of you. Hey, 911, <laughs> like the car. Um, so anyways, the um, there's a such thing as rage bait. So that's what I think this, I think that's what that stuff is. It's rage bait. It's like, can we get middle-aged people pissed off about something? Or can we get, I don't know, the guitar community pissed off? They just know, like it's a, just, it's a thing. So I, I mean, I don't even know if they actually believe what they print or if it's just a piss off. And cause they're gonna get Rick Beato all flamed up. <laughs> <laughs> and he's gonna go crazy. So to answer uh, to answer everybody's questions, did I see it? Yes, because of you guys, I saw it. Uh, and uh, I almost, uh, you know, I tell you guys all the time, thank you so much. You guys are so great. I wouldn't know that for this one. Ah, you guys suck. <laughs> I could have not known about it and been so happy. Um, so the, <laughs> the uh, what is it? It was missing so many great guitar players. And here's the problem. I can't even say the names of the guitar players that's missing because if I do, as soon as I say one, you guys are going to put in the comments a thousand I forgot. That's the problem with that. It's It's totally... It's totally just silly. They should have said, you know, like I wouldn't enjoy it. I'll tell you what I would enjoy. Um, there's a series on YouTube I, I talked about last week that I love. I love it. It's the number one hit songs from 1955 to 2020. It's not the best songs from those eras. It's the number one song, something that's quantifiable. It was a hit, whether it was good or not, right? There's a song. I realized how not old I am. I'm old, but apparently not that old. Dude, in this, every time you get to the section of the 70s, there's a song called something like Hot Popcorn. What the heck is it, right? Number one song. Watch this. Hot Popcorn. Like, I have no faith in... Yeah. Okay. Hot Butter Popcorn. Uh, so apparently it's a disco song. What the hell was wrong, you guys? 1972 is before I was born. So let me tell you something for you guys that are a little older. What the hell was wrong with you people? <laughs> This song is horrible. We thought it was a joke and it kept coming up month after month. So for the guy, for, for those of you who don't know, let me go where I can share. Uh, so apparently during 1972, there was a song called Hot Butter Popcorn and it's a disco perfection version. So you, you can check it out. I am not going to link it. You have to search it because unlike what I had to go through the Rolling Stones, you will have to go through a little difficulty to see something horrible. For those of you who like the song, I would dare say I'm sorry, but I really don't want to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Susan says it's popcorn by hot butter. That's That actually makes more sense. Uh, so again, I'm not, I know I'm being sarcastic. You understand I'm going for more of the joke, right? So yeah, so what I'm saying is, I'm not saying it's a great song. What it was, was a hit song. So to me, that makes more sense. It charted or it sold a lot of albums. So if you said, like, for instance, we talk about guitars, Petrucci was on my second channel on the podcast and he said he had the number one selling artist guitar in the world. And, uh, and, uh, you know, that was a controversial statement he said, but here's what's interesting is, uh, you know, he was basing it on how many guitars he sold. It's not, uh, you know, just the magazine's opinion about he had, he didn't say like, I have the best signature guitar in the world. So the same thing with this, it's, uh, I think it was done on purpose. They're going to leave people off on purpose or they're going to do things on purpose. Cause that's how you're going to get to circulate. That's how we're talking about today. Um, but what I would rather do is like I said, instead of saying like, these are the best guitar players, um, you know, to me, there's, I would rather see lists like, you know, uh, who is the most influ influential guitar players of a genre and then ask people in that genre. That's interesting, right? Um, because even if it's not your guitar players not mentioned, it doesn't mean they weren't influential. It just means that a lot of people didn't have a connection with it when that were asked, I guess, right? So <laughs> somebody says Baby Shark made it to number 32. You know, I don't even mind the popcorn song being a hit. I just couldn't believe it was a number one hit for multiple months. <laughs> that's a pretty, that's a pretty imp uh, impressive task. So there you go. So back to the Rolling Stones thing. That's my take on it. Um, it's made to piss you off and it did for a lot of people. And, um, you know, and like I said, there's, of course, they're going to leave a lot of great guitar players off. Uh, I was also in shock, like everybody. But of course, my first thought was, this is on purpose. It was made to make us nuts. Okay, so what else do we got? We have, hold on, let me jump around somewhere. 
Let me refresh this perfect time to drink some water. Okay, we have my coffee says, uh, new old guitar, 2020 PRS S2 Vela. Great playing and sounding guitar. What is the big difference in the S2 and the core Vela? There isn't a core Vela, uh, minus semi hollow. There is no core Vela. And when I say there is no, um, what I mean is there's no production core Vela. If they, there is probably a core or a private stock Vela that exists that was made as some kind of limited edition or done. But Vela was an instrument made specifically for the S2 line. Uh, it was one of the things. Um, the um, the story I was told by people at Paul Reed Smith Guitars was that Paul fell in love with this bridge, um, and he really really liked it, and so he was using it on guitars. And that's the bridge on the Vela. That bridge is, from my understanding, is designed by another uh, luthier and licensed to PRS. They pay a licensing fee for it or whatever, and they have the him make it or it's made by somebody else. You know, obviously. Um, because he, they wanted the bridge. They thought it was really good. So the Vela, as far as I know, has always been an S2 product. But like I said, I've seen, I think, a private stock Vela, and there might be some core Vela that was made or a production one. But trust me, you're not going to find it, <laughs> you know, uh, easily. You know? So so that, I hope that makes that sense. And that's why another reason why I like the Vela as an S2, because I like guitars. Um, I like uh, good guitars period, but I like guitars that are sometimes like the Vela where it's like, you know, you have it and it's, and it's not as expensive as core, but it's not a, it's not a downgraded version of a core. It's just, it wouldn't make sense to make the Vela any different than it is. Okay. Um, why did my thing refresh so weird? Okay. Back to, thank you, Lit Eve, and thank you, um, Floodland for the super stickers with the thumb up. It always looks like a green chicken, but it's a bird. <laughs> uh, Bulletproof Panda. You know, there's a lot of people with a weird panda in their sign on. Okay, Bulletproof Panda says, what may be a good first 212 cabinet to get? I'm buying a Hughes and Kettner uh, Nano Amp for an insanely good price, but never owned a cab and need advice. Um, well, first, don't forget used, right? Especially in cabinets. And I've always said this, bigger cabinets like 212s, 412s, always, always, always hit the Craigslist, your, uh, you know, what's it, your Facebook uh, marketplace, you know, go local, right? Because they are just not worth the ship. So you can find somebody that will definitely work with you on the price and don't go what they're posting, you know, um, like I said, reach out to them, always respectful and just say, hey, look, I'm looking at this 212, got any room? I've even said this and it's worked with stuff like that. You can reach out to somebody local and say, hey, look, I, I like the cabinet, but, you know, I'm not in it for that price. But, hey, if you find yourself, you know, if you find it's not moving for you, here's my information, right? Whether that's a week or two out, just let me know. And you never know. You get lucky and after a couple of days. They think about it. Um, always, though, uh, I will tell you this. When you offer somebody, you always say that it's a really stupid thing to say, but you have to do it. You go, hey, I'll give you this much cash now. Right. Because the last thing people want to do is haggle and then think about, you know, but I can meet you next Tuesday as soon as my, right. You're like, no, it's like cash. And now and and let them basically say, no, I don't want easy money. Right. It's 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 not worth it for me. But definitely with the cabinets, um, you definitely want to think about uh, used because you can save a lot of money used. Cabs don't hold a ton of value, but also they shipping wise, they're a nightmare. Um, if you have to go new cabinets. I mean, there's a ton of great 212 cabinets out there. I mean, Hughes and Kittner makes a decent cabinet. It's pretty good. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if Ignators, they're not in business anymore. Ignator, uh, uh, Boutique Amps was making Ignator shut it down, but they made a really good 212 cabinet. Um, I did the Harley Benton 212. It's pretty decent. Like I said, it's got good speakers in it and it's affordable. But again, like I said, you know, if you can find something used, you might find something better for that, for the same price. Um, I mean... Like I said, we can go on for days. Keep in mind, it's not just about the cabinet. It's about the speakers. You want some good speakers more so than the cabinet. I really focus on the speakers more than the cabinet. So, so you know. Because um, I'm not touring. So sometimes cabinet construction is, well, it's important, period. But it's really important if you're, you know, throwing it on the back of a truck or in a, in a van or, you know, and you're hauling it back and forth, you're, you're t torturing it. It's super, super important. However, however... 
uh, if it's just going to be in your home studio at your house or in your bedroom, the cabinet construction, how durable and how much beating it could take doesn't have to factor in as much. Just make sure that it's, you know, it's a cabinet design you like and it sounds good. And then you put some good speakers in it. Uh, Michael Nielsen saying the vertical rev 212. That's, uh, I haven't, tr I've tried a couple, I tried, when I tried the rev D20 and G20, I tried them through rev cabinets. I would imagine rev makes good cabinets. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think who else, like I said, I'm, you know, there's so many companies that make good cabinets. Um, so I'm like, look around. I, I think I told you guys, I switched for some reason to all Friedman cabinets. I still have all my other cabinets. I have maces. I'm looking at right now. I have Mesa cabinets. I have Tone King cabinets. I have, I have, I don't know, I, everything. I'm like looking, I have even custom cabinets. I have these custom cabinets, but I switched to Friedman cabinets one day. I just like this cabinet. And so I bought a bunch of them and I just started using them. But, um, yeah, so I hope that helps. But used, like I said, try to find that deal, especially if you don't have a serious preference. Like I said, find a good cabinet at a good deal. That's easier to find. Front Level Midnight says, been five years, but I'm finally getting my Shell Pink Chicago Music Exchange exclusive SG. It's on its way. Stoked. Happy Friday. Any Chicago Music Exchange exclusives or Wild Woods, you enjoy. So, um, yes. Um, I don't know. The answer is no. <laughs> yes, I've had them. No, I don't still enjoy them. Um, I have a, I got a, I got the green Chicago Music Exchange uh, SG. It was fantastic, but it suffered the problem that happens when you buy two of a same type of guitar. My uh, burst colored SG, I just, something about it. I just liked it a little bit more. That's all. You know, there was nothing wrong with the green one. It just, I like the burst one more. So it didn't, it didn't stay. Um, Wildwood guitars, you know, I'm a huge fan. I got my uh, strap from them and um, I, I, you know, it's all right. <laughs> it's not their fault. Nothing they did. It's just not really sticking. But so, you know, um, this uh, beautiful Paul Reed Smith CE24 Semi Hollow is from Wildwood and it, but it's not an exclusive. It's just, a, I bought it from Wildwood because um, I like them. I want to support them. So, um, like I said, if I can buy something from a mid-size or small size store, I do that. You know, obviously, um, I had a, a small mid-size store for 13 years. So, of course, I, I want to support smaller businesses every time I can. So, that's just how I do it. Um, and and that's the easiest way, <laughs> getting a guitar like that. Uh, Miserable Turd says, I tried to become a Patreon member, but it said I'm blocked. Um, well, it wouldn't be us, so you'd have to figure out why you're blocked, because we don't have a blocked thing in Patreon. So, um, obviously, because pay, you pay to be a patron, we wouldn't block you from uh, um, money, <laughs> right? I mean, that's how it works. I, I mean, think about this. We, we literally, this is, um, it's our second biggest revenue stream on YouTube. So, YouTube's my first biggest re revenue stream, the, what I get paid from AdSense. That's my number one that's the number one way I make money on this platform. And then number two is the patron. And also we tie in the members, which is also on YouTube. Uh, we are fan funded predominantly. Those two, like I said, those two things, those two entities, uh, YouTube, which is Google AdSense, and patron members, which is patron members, uh, that's 90% of all the YouTube revenue I make right there. And I'm just being nice right now when I say 90. I could say 95, but I'm going to say 90. Um, so obviously it's how we it's how we operate. Um, as you guys know, there's uh, hundreds of channels that literally run 100% on company-sponsored content, right? They're just constantly putting out videos because the companies are paying for videos um, where I just don't do that as much. Um, I don't do as many videos um, and I don't do as much corporate uh, or company sponsored content, um, like that. And, um, it's because I have you guys and you guys are fantastic. And that's what supports this channel. So my guess is, uh, the only thing that should be blocking you is of course, if you're a $5 member, you can't see $10 stuff, you know, I mean, that's just how it works. You know, $10 can't see 25, but other than that, I will do this though. After the show, I will look, uh, personally when I'm timestamping, I'll pull it up and look to see if there's something that's stopping you. You never know right? You don't control all things on the internet when I, you know, uh, these things, you never know what these YouTube and Patreon, all they do. They all seem to all have their own minds and do things to me daily that I wouldn't even know anything about. So there you go. Um, Andrea says, I'm fascinated. No, I'm fantasizing about making a parts caster where I put a Sustainiac as a fourth pickup, which is controlled by a blend knob. Dumb idea. Hmm. Interesting. I've played uh, Sustainiacs a few times. 
No. <laughs> you know, the Sustainiac is one of those things like I, I don't currently have one. I did a review of one and, um, you know, once I was done, I didn't keep it. And, uh, I, I kind of want one like, you know, it's just this thing. Um, but I found myself, you know, not, not doing it. <laughs> uh, so to answer your question, it's no, you should make a parts. I love parts casters. You know, I love the idea. I like custom stuff. I've been very uh, uh, upfront about this over the years. I'm a huge fan of I have it. No one else does. I love that. I, I always think that's cool. And it, but not in the elitist, like mine's more expensive than yours. I could care less what it costs. I like the fact that it's unique somehow. And I've learned this and it has nothing to do with what I set out thinking. I never thought that way. I never said, oh, I want to have this only one that has this or I want something unique. And then therefore, haha. It was what I noticed was when stuff would rotate out, right? When I wouldn't keep stuff, the stuff that stayed was unique. It was something so unique and unique is interesting because it's not a it's not a limited guitar it's not a it's not a um expensive rare guitar it could be a friend gave this to me a friend made this for me a friend and i had a hilarious event when you know when we did this right um the interaction was unique it it's just it's attached to a memory which i don't want to let go of i don't want that memory to go away you know this gnl guitar right there this this uh, margarita one whoops now i'm pointing at it you know you guys know it's been here on the channel since the day it's got here um you know you can see the guitars that stay and go over the years that guitar it, i could say gnl made it for me and therefore you know that's why i keep it but i don't keep it for that reason i keep it because when i look at that guitar you know what i think of i think of the most one of the most amazing interviews and factory tours i was able to get to do right when i it was just a, it was so you know every factory tour i've done has something cool maybe it's a technology thing maybe it's i learn stuff right the kiesel guys i learned so much from the kiesel guys it was crazy um but sometimes it's a technology thing. But sometimes, like in GNL, it's this like history, right? It's this heritage that was really interesting. So it ties me to it. So there's certain things that just tie me to, you know, a, a time or a moment. So um, parts casters, you'll you know, same thing. You put this guitar together, and it's your guitar, and it's just special to you, and it's because it's got what you want in it. It's super cool. And um, one of the things I I like. But I also miss is, you know, uh, being on YouTube for a few years now and having, uh, you know, worked with so many companies and having a platform or whatever, you know, now I can work with companies and we can make a custom guitar, you know, together like a, you know, like a parts caster, right? Put it together and that's kind of cool. And it's kind of fun. But at the core of it, I mean, if I didn't have the YouTube gig, I would just simply just be putting a parts cast together like, like the good old days. Um, so there you go. Uh... Maddie Two Hats says, I feel I swapped a bridge single coil for a rail humbucker on a strat. I'm getting loud buzz from the humbucker. Any tips? So you swapped a single coil for a rail humbucker and a strat, and you're getting a loud buzz. I know I'm repeating it, but I'm walking through the problem. So first of all, sounds to me um, that just because it's a rail humbucker doesn't mean that it's not coil splittable so that you might have four conductors, which is going to be five wires because there's two grounds, right? So you're going to have the four core four core wires that are going to be color coded. And then you're going to have this bare wire that's now my thumb apparently in this. <laughs> so, um, and you can wire it up and be still in coil split mode or even worse. So you want to make sure that that's, um, your, your, make sure you're wired up correctly that way. That would be my first thought that you're having the problem. So especially now you are saying loud buzz and that's concerning because that's more than, um, 60 cycle hum. And again, if it's a four conductor wire, cause here's what's great. <laughs> if it's two conductor and you solder them to the wrong uh, terminals, like you put the ground on the hot and the hot on the ground, it doesn't really matter. Right. You'll have phase issues when you're mixing with other pickups, but essentially it's still going to work. Right. This is great about it. Like I said, I did a short where I said it's basically one wire. It's a start and a finish. So it's the best way to think of it. And it doesn't really matter. But a four conductor, you could have all kinds of problems that you've done. <laughs> so you want to double check that. Now, here's my first suggestion. 
Um, where I've noticed when I've done repairs for people who bring in problems, you know, and I'm like, oh, I can't believe you did this, right? No, I've never said that. Um, but what I'm saying is when you bring something like that to me, the first thing I notice is you're using a very, very logical idea of going, oh, I've wired in other brands pickups and red is hot and black is ground and green is this, right? And green and white together where it could be all over the place. You understand like DiMaggio red is hot, but on a Seymour Duncan black is hot, right? And green is ground. So it's, uh, and red and I think white are your coil split, right? So um, you definitely want to go online, okay? If you don't know how to test it with a multimeter to figure out where <laughs> what, what your wire is. Um, and the fact that you said single coil uh, rail humbucker and you didn't give a brand, it might, makes me think maybe you got it off of like, you know, Amazon or third party site, which is nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, there's tons of great pickups you can get for 30 bucks out there, that's for sure. But um, if that's the case, you really gotta make sure you're using the wiring they're saying. And then if you are, and you're having a problem, now you gotta be smart enough to know you can't trust their wiring. In other words, um, I've, I've absolutely had it happen on Seymour Duncan multiple times where they, they miss, they miss, uh, they miss, they messed up the wires. So the wires weren't right. It happens. The new guy starts, right? We call it first day. Everybody has a first day, right? So the hope is that not every day is your first day. <laughs> that that's actually our joke about first day. When you go, when everybody, when we go somewhere and somebody screws something up, we go, oh, it's their first day. And then they'll go, I've been here three years. And I'm like, oh, so every day is your first day. <laughs> So <laughs> that's what you don't want. You don't want every day to be your first day. But yeah, you could have got a first day pickup. So those are some solutions I would say try and try to give that out. Uh, M. Kara says, I don't know how to use an effects loop. I put my pedal set in front of my amp to practice at home guitar pedal to input advantage of the loop. So yeah, I have an old video. Maybe it's worth redoing because it's like, you know, really old. Uh, but I have a video talking about effects loops. And the best thing to, 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 to know about effects loop that's really important is this. Um, generally speaking, you want your time base effects to go through your effects loop. So that would be like, you know, your delay pedal or your tremolo or your chorus or your flanger. You could put those through your effects loop. Me, I only have one uh, hard kind of hard rule that I follow, which is reverb delay always through effects loop. <laughs> um, because of the fact that uh, it, to me, it just sounds better. Okay, but that's not a guarantee because this is a funny story. Um, one of my guitar teachers uh, at the shop, we had George Lynch come and do a clinic. He brought his amp in, or no, he didn't bring his amp in, he brought his guitar in, and then George went to the back store to smoke a cigarette. So, of course, we all ran to the back of the store to pretend we all smoke cigarettes um, to hang out with George. So we were all like fake smoking. It was kind of a weird moment. So, you know, he's out there smoking. We're all like, hey, we're here out to get a smoke too. And then none of us had cigarettes. But we, we <laughs> so anyways, while we're doing that, uh, Frank had a, a volunteer to set up his rig. When George came back, George goes, what is this? And Frank goes, I set up your rig. And he goes, that's all wrong. And he goes, no, I put your delays through your effects loop and stuff. And George goes, no, I run everything through the front of the amp. I don't care. So he goes, and because that's old school. It's a very martial way of thinking, right? Those guys used to not have effects loops back in the day. And they run everything through the front of the amp, distort it or not, and then adjust it. So, um, so uh, you know, that's the rule of the effects loop. I think the time-based effects sound better, especially delay. But again, like I said... You know, I mean, George Lynch doesn't use it, so you don't have to either. <laughs> um, but I do have a video. I will link it. Like I said, it's a little old, but it's one of those that's got a lot of views and a lot of comments saying, thanks, man, this totally makes sense. And it's kind of just me walking through pedals and walking through it. And it's one of those just, you know, kind of, uh, and, and maybe I'll redo it. The problem about redoing videos, I always, people always ask you to redo videos. And the problem, and every YouTuber will never tell you this for some reason. I don't know why. I watch them, I'm watching other shows and they'll, they'll get asked the same thing. And they don't, they go, somebody goes, you should remake your video about this. And they go, oh yeah, I'll do it. And I say the same thing. And here's why we don't want to do it. The old videos have a crap ton of views and your new video won't get as many views. And what's going to happen is you'll, your new video will never pass your old video. I have this with my, uh, what, uh, who makes who videos I've done three now and the first one's riddled with comments every day because it's got you know like a million views or something and then people are like 
you should remake it. <laughs> I've even put in the comments and pinned it. I've remade this. Go to this one. And then the remake has more, slightly more, you know, views than the newer remake. And that remake, everybody's like, you should remake it. And I'll put in the pin that thing. I have remade it. Go to the new one. It's just, you know, that's how it works. It's the way a you. It's the way YouTube works. Once a video is done really well, you're just, it's, you know, it's just hard to beat it. And until you beat it, no one's gonna know about it. So, um, but that being said, I'll still want to do it. All right. Uh, Hmm. What are we doing? Uh, do I want to go back into the early questions or the weekly questions? What are we doing? I'd like to really delete some of this stuff. I feel like I'm reading all over the place here. Okay. Uh, um, another question that came up this week. This is a good time. This is from Yuri. Thank you, Yuri. He sent me a couple this week, so it was really cool. But of course, this one I got hit a bunch of times on. And uh, so I thought we'd talk about it real fast. Um, I saw a video, Rhett Schull and uh, Robert Baker didn't specifically talk about this instance, but they just did a video uh, kind of like this. Um, so there's a, so the, there's a video, obviously KDH did a video. Uh, the Guitar Geek did a video. I think that's what set off the whole thing. Uh, it was, has, have you seen the guitar review drama around the Arrow brand threatening YouTube channels? Um, the Guitar Geek, legal action, threatening legal action. Well, of course, I got the email from you. So of course I went and checked it out what it was about. Um, so I'm going to give everybody a real quick synopsis. And then I want to just talk about what I can help, help add to the conversation that might be interesting. Um, so long story short, a brand called Arrow brand, which, uh, uh, reached out to uh, the guitar geek and asked for a video. So KDH did a video. I watched his and I'm going to echo what KDH said, cause I have the same experience KDH has, which is Arrow brand contacted me, uh, like seven times. So I, I get tons and tons of emails every day from companies. And you guys, you can imagine you're getting a lot, you know, a lot of companies that are more desperate are going to contact you more. In other words, my more desperate, they need to get out there, right? They're trying to get out there. You're going to get a lot of companies that are like, they need the movement. Right. Um, and the, uh, uh, it was a really, it was the email that you like, cause it just says, Hey, we want, we want you to do a video. What's required. Cause that's a nice that way to start the conversation. You just go, this is what I need. And then we can work together. The problem is, um, I, I would love to tell you that I just thought the product was silly or I just didn't want to do the product or I didn't think it would work for you guys, but that's not what happened. Um, I don't do any products. Uh, there's two ways that I will never do a product. Okay. Two, two, two scenarios. I don't do Kickstarters. The reason is, is because of, even though I love spark amps, you know, and I, I just recently bought the spark micro. Um, it hasn't been delivered yet, but I just bought it. Um, I didn't really know what Kickstarters were for the most part. I had kind of seen Kickstarters. I kind of messed with it, you know, uh, not, not totally fulfilled, uh, understanding when spark came out, apparently it was a Kickstarter. I didn't know that spark had reached out to me, asked me to check out the amp. I said, sure. They sent me the amp and I got a gazillion comments saying, I can't believe they haven't shipped people their amps they paid for, but they're giving YouTubers amps. And you gotta understand like my video is out now. So there's nothing I can do about it now. I didn't know before. And of course I 100% agreed with everybody. I was like, yeah, why are you shipping me a product that you do not, <laughs> you're not supplying to the customers who paid for it. And I was, so I was a little concerned with that. I voiced my concerns with them about that and some other issues people had, and I've never talked to them again, or they've never talked to me again. So I don't know if that's coincidence. I always tell you that cause you know, cause it could be the person I talked to no longer works there anymore. It could be a thousand reasons, but so, you know, that's why when I ever asked about the next spark editions, why it's never on the channel, apparently my questioning those things may have led to a disconnect with working with me, or it just, they disconnect, you know, that person left and the new person just, I don't know, doesn't want know the channel or whatever. My point is, um, i tell you guys all the time, I'm not smart, but I know to lean into experience when you have a good one or a bad one and kind of learn from it. What I learned from that is I don't want to work with companies doing Kickstarters. Um, the, you know, I don't trust it. I don't know it. I don't understand it. And I sure as hell don't uh, want to be responsible for it. So with Arrow brand, before I could go any further in the conversation, I was like, that's a Kickstarter. I don't do that. And the reason I pointed that out is I should also point out the second thing, which is I've said a million times before, if you're not a legitimate brand, if you're not GNL, if you're not Fender, if you're not Schecter, if you're not, uh, you know, Gibson, Sweetwater, you know, um, uh, even Guitar Center, I don't care. If you're not a legitimate brand uh, that is trusted in the market to some degree, 
Um, the only way I will work with you is if you're on Amazon. So I tell you guys all the time, all these off the wall little brand companies I will do, um, I will do them if you can buy the product from Amazon and if the product that's sent to me is sent to me from Amazon. Um, and I, I look, I can make a, a mistake. I could talk about a product that, you know, and then in, ends up hurting everybody. Um, and I can do my due best diligence and I'll still be wrong, but you know, that's my, that's my start. That's my set level. So like I said, so like when I talk about all these weird little brands, like this guitar is only $109, like it's, it's come from Amazon and at least you have a nice return policy. It's really nice. Um, and so like I said, that's something I can at least lean into and trust on. Um, so in this case, this company didn't do that. And of course it was Kickstarter. So that's why I didn't review it. Um, the reason I point that out is I just want you to know, cause you know, I think, it's important you should know what the standard is that I'm looking at for something like that. Um, the What ended up happening with this video was a YouTuber critiqued it, and apparently then this company sent the other YouTubers that had the product, hey, basically we wanna see the videos before you release them, and if you cause any uh, damage, you can be responsible. Um, what I saw was very vague, uh, what I call legalese, where it's just basically said, you know, you can be responsible. It didn't say if he gave a bad review, it's gonna be responsible. My gut instinct, just so you know, would be that Aerobrand has no idea that what the difference between a review and a demo is. And that's because I don't believe half of you even know what the difference is. <laughs> um, I have had conversations with many YouTube channels uh, at these events and some YouTube channels have stopped me in mid sentence to correct me to say, oh, I'm not a reviewer, I'm a demo channel. And I go, oh, okay. Okay, so everybody has a different concept of what that is. Um, if you're a reviewer or a demo channel, <laughs> so um, and so the companies have that trouble too, disseminating that. Um, I don't feel like companies have a problem figuring out that I'm I lean into being more like a review channel as I'm not working with 90% of the companies. Like Fender's never going to send me a product. It's never going to happen, right? I mean, let's be clear. I've I've I basically all out insulted their CEO for what I, how I think he handled things on this podcast. I mean, there's just no way <laughs> it's going to like, once you say those things on this podcast, it's never, there's no, until Fender gets a new CEO, I'm probably not going to be working Fender. But, um, so that's my, my point with this is, um, that's what happened with that stuff. Uh, I don't know what the, I really don't understand the whole thing. And that's where I want to end with this. Uh, basically someone, was sent a product and was told by the company, you better not release the video if it's not good. That's not what they said, but you better not release the video unless we see it. And uh, my advice is to those channels that did it is don't do the videos. <laughs> like I said, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Or like I said, everybody's going to have their own system. <laughs> Lewis says, I forgot about the CEO thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they did. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm just how stupid I am for saying the stuff I say on this channel all the time. They, uh, uh, <laughs> uh the, uh, <laughs> the, um, Patrick says demo channel. See, this is good. Demo channel equals paid chill review channel. See, what's funny about that is I think that's where the confusion is. I would say a demo channel, a channel that views themselves as a demo channel, uh, means that they give n absolutely no opinion on product, okay? And this is where it gets a little tricky because I've seen channels that became demo channels. So you would go, oh, they do give opinions, but if you look back, it's been three or four years since they've given opinion because they've kind of switched their mentality. So the, internally, a bunch of YouTube channels talking to each other off camera behind the scenes, in that context, I will tell you that the general consensus is a demo channel is someone who demonstrates or shows a product to an audience, but gives no opinion positive or negative about it. it. It does nothing to influence the purchase. A review channel would be a critique, giving critique. Interestingly enough, the next conversation, which is always funny, is like, hey, you know, whether or not channels should be paid or given free products or loan products to do the reviews. And of course, that's a rat's nest of hell. And all I ever say is the same thing I'm gonna say, what I've said in the past is, everyone is biased. Um, I can name 20 companies, I'm not gonna, that I hate. I fucking hate them. And you wouldn't guess. My own friends can guess who they are because it's not the products I hate, it's the people. So I don't work with them, they're people. I work with their products. So they get on the channel through us buying them. And because I, I like the products, I just, the people are horrible. So 
the reason I, I do that is because, and then I come in and when I do the video, I base my entire opinion on the product and how the product performs and not that jerk that I met once who has, you know, was horrible, right? Or so-and-so. And same thing, I try to be the same way too. It's really tough. Like I said, the same thing's hard when you're reviewing the other way. Like I've told you, sometimes you'll see in the middle of video, black, uh, uh, black Mountain Picks, exactly. I've said it every time in the video, you can't find a video of me talking about those picks and not mentioning that I think Cole's like a sweet human being. The reason I say that in the video is not so that you think he's a sweet human being. I want you to know exactly where my mind is, <laughs> okay? Um, my mind is I like him. And so I'm going to talk honestly about the product, but keep in mind, I'm going in it with an attitude of, I like this person. So, right. So that's, that's basically how it is. You have to, you have to be as honest as you can, but the best way, the best honesty that you can give someone is let them know exactly what the bias is. That's why I told you, I don't like the comment unbiased review. Uh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> that means you don't care. And so if you don't care, why are you talking about it? Uh, you either should passionately love it, hate it. I mean, I can understand different to some degree, but for the most part, that's just my opinion on that. And my last opinion is, I think none of us YouTubers should give opinions about all this stupid stuff. <laughs> you just figure out how you, <laughs> figure out what you want to watch and hang and just watch what you watch. Enjoy yourselves. Please enjoy yourselves, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's easy to figure out who's who's horrible and who's good and who you like and who you don't like, who's talented, who's not talented. Just watch what you want and watch what you want. And don't watch what you don't like. Uh, what do they call that? What do they call that when you when you hate hate watching? Don't hate watch. If you hate something, don't watch it. You're just going to make yourself miserable. It's, your life's too short to worry about that. Um, Tom says, I love the funny. <laughs> I, I think I'm in a mood. <laughs> So, so you guys know, I, I, again, I kind of, I want to share this with this whole podcast is about sharing things and talking. And, uh, I'm really exhausted, uh, because I've made more videos than I've ever made in a shortest amount of time. It's because I got hit with a ton of companies at the same time that wanted a video in like no time at all. And then I just said yes for some reason, but more importantly, uh, my 25th anniversary is coming up. It's a big deal for my wife and I, as you guys know, my anniversary is in November. It's our 25th anniversary. Why it's important is we didn't have a honeymoon um, because we really didn't have a wedding. <laughs> Uh, we did the quickie marriage. Uh, we did not go to the, the, the justice of the peace or whatever. We went to a quickie chapel, uh, like they have in Vegas, but we had one here in Mesa, Arizona, and we did a quickie wedding and, um, we didn't even hang out after the wedding <laughs> with each other. And that funny, it was just, uh, uh, is it really, um, so anyways, what is this a big deal? It's a big deal because 25th anniversary when my wife and I said we are going to actually go and do something uh, that is, you know, like a honeymoon, right? We've never we've never done that. Our kids are grown now. We're empty nesters. And it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a what? Um, <laughs> Brian says a shotgun. It wasn't a shotgun. It's just fast. Just to give you an idea how fast the wedding was. I bought my wedding ring uh, with my mother at Walmart at 9.30. 30 at night before the day before we got married. <laughs> uh, I'm not ashamed of any of this. It's just when you say it out loud, you just go, God, what is it? When being young, right? God bless it. But, uh, <laughs> but anyways, so we're going to have an actual little honeymoon uh, where we go and, 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 and uh, we're excited about that. And to do that, uh, as you can imagine, I don't get vacation time. You know, you're self-employed. You don't get vacation time. You don't get time off of work. Uh, so you got to double up the workload before and then after uh, to do something like this. So I'm excited about it. So I'm just sharing it with you guys. And uh, so there you go. Okay. Uh, Nick. No, i sorry. I'm, I'm missing Vimp69. He says, are you and Shauna doing anything for Halloween? Are we doing anything for Halloween? Uh, yes. We're going to do what we did last year. Um we uh, we did this last year. It was amazing. We took our bicycles and we put some lights on them and we drove around the neighborhood and the neighborhood next to us. We just drove around and checked out all the costumes. And uh, we'll, um, my son might come over and hand out candy. I think that might happen. Otherwise, we might do the thing where the lazy thing where you put the bowl of candy in a skeleton. You say, take one. And, you know, who knows if they take 10 or take one. But we might do that. But we're going to ride around the neighborhood. We really enjoyed that. It was like checking out the houses with the cost, you know, the, 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 ha the haunted houses. And then checking out the costumes. It was really fun. And just riding around for a little bit. It was a really good 
good night. So that's what our plan is uh, for this time too. I was we really enjoyed it last year. Um, we tried to get our kids to go, and we were like, let's do all four bikes, and we'll do like a whole light up parade of the bikes, and the, the kids don't care. Like I said, my kids are my kids are adults. We have adults, <laughs> so they 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 want to do their adult things. Uh, Nick says, uh, I love the podcast with Shauna. Are you going to do a promo with Stu Mac on Stu Mac's membership this year? Thank you. Uh, so first, thank you for that. If you guys know, um, my wife does bonus podcasts with me on Patreon and for the members, and then, um, some of them or some of it in some form gets put onto the second channel. So there is one now in the second channel. You can watch it. Um, for those of you that are interested in, 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 learning a little bit more what's removed from them when they go to the public channel or to the platforms is not anything in super important it's just stuff that i think maybe the main usually the members and the patrons are a little bit more involved with me and the channel more so than just you know the gear stuff so i try to keep the gear centric stuff to the podcast public and some of the stuff that's more behind the scenes about the channel uh, to the, to the patrons. So that's why it's done that way. Um, but you can check it out for the most part. And like I said, you get 90% of it, 85, 90% of the, the podcast from the thing. So if you want to check it out, it's on the second channel, I'll put a link. Um, it seems to go over well on the other channel. Um, some people even say I should stop doing this and let her do it. She, she, you're probably right. Um, the Stumax thing, I, uh, need to, uh, do that. <laughs> Uh, which means right now Shauna's watching the show and Shauna, we need to do that. Uh, we need to get a hold of Allie at Stumax and get the, our Stumac and get that taken care of. I've been, like I said, I've been focused on the double videos. Plus, um, I got uh, a Music Nomad sent out their new fret and dress file, and I'm trying to make a quick video comparing that to my favorite file, which is the Stumac file, to see uh, what I think and uh, share that with you guys. So uh, there you go. Uh, it was Bill says Sweetwater honored my ask for $200 off a $900 Charvel SoCal HHST. So many letters. <laughs> humbucker, humbucker, uh, hardtail, uh, wired, uh, okay. Uh, money to save them card fee. Okay. A uh, new guitar day soon. Thanks for Phil for telling us to ask. Yes, always ask for a discount. Um, like I said, I think you'll get better deals from mom and pops than the big chains, but always, doesn't matter if it's a big chain or a mom and pop, always ask for a discount. If it's going to make you make the purchase, go ahead and do that. Like I said, always do it. That's why I tell you about the affiliate links and stuff. Don't worry about the affiliate links. Um, what they pay us is pennies, uh, all these companies, and they're constantly figuring out ways to pay less pennies, which is so it's their prerogative. And um, for you guys, like I said, put that money in your pocket if you can. You know, um, ultimately keep in mind, like I just told you, my main revenue source is the YouTube content, you know, the videos, the counts of these millions and millions of views. And then of course the Patreon back system. So the affiliates is like, it's nice. It's nice to have a little other money coming in from something, but it's just not that important to us. So like I said, um, if you, if you don't want to make a phone call and you're going to click a button, use an affiliate link. Cause we'll get something out of it. And I appreciate that from you. But if you can make a phone call or send an email, you will always sell yourself way more money than what you could even close the, we, we would get for it. So put that money in your pocket. You've, you worked hard to earn it, keep it right. Especially in today's economy. Okay. Um, next one. Fem69, oh, thank you, man, uh, for the honeymoon uh, money. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, I, I really appreciate that. So you know, <laughs> I shouldn't say this. I'm going to say it. Someone say it. Uh, you can never do nothing. So... <laughs> When it comes to YouTube, so when I was uh, when we were discussing our honeymoon and our plans and what we're gonna do and all this stuff, um, we uh, I said uh, I said I have an idea for a video. <laughs> I said everyone's been asking about the the micro spark. I go maybe I should take one with us to like the hotel and stuff, and then I'll do an unboxing and I can check it out and see how I like it and. <laughs> So we're going to do that. And she's like, okay, if that's the only video you do. And I go, okay, that's great. So <laughs> YouTube is the never ending grind. You just got to, you're constantly like, what, doing something. It's just a, it's a thing. And you know what? It's not horrible. It's just, it's, it's like I said, you're got, you got to grind it out. You got to grind it out. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. It's Spark Go. Thank you guys. I had no idea. I just know it was one twenty nine ninety nine plus shipping, uh, or no tax plus tax. Uh, it was one thirty nine delivered, and I um, 
I bought it from uh, uh, Sweetwater. I went to, funny enough, I went to Guitar Center to buy it because I was like, oh, they might have a local. And then it said, because I wanted to see if it's in stock. So I looked for it in stock and it said, okay, st- the store by me. And then it, I went to buy it and it said, oh, you can pick up the store. And I go, that's even better. And it says, oh, we'll let you know if it's at that store. And if not, we'll let you know when we ship it to you. That's what the message said. And that made me nervous. I was like, you let me know is it there or not do you have it what's going on here so then i go screw it so i went to sweetwater and it said that they had it was at the warehouse in glendale which is in arizona by me uh down and so i bought it there and it got here in one day they shipped it yesterday got here today so um <laughs> so it's all about getting here the fastest because like i said i want to have it and use it for the thing brian says uh honey, headless delos yes um most of you guys don't know that exists uh, that I have, so you guys know I have a Delos, Ta-da. but what you don't know is I have a clone of that guitar headless. Um, and the reason is, is cause the people at Kiesel were really cool when I said, Hey, I would like a headless version of this guitar. Cause I really like it. And it's actually a, it's actually a video coming. I want to do a, a, an apples to apples comparison of a headless versus a headstock guitar with the same specs to see how that so- sounds. And then I have it, um, really cool. Um, you know, what's funny is, do I see, yeah, I do. Hey, I want to tell, uh, do I want to tell a funny story? Maybe I do. Thank you. Uncle left eye. Thank you for the happy anniversary. Super chat, man. That was really cool. It's, uh, it's nice. I will tell you about the anniversary when it's over the trip. Um, it's been a rocky start. (laughs) <laughs> to say the least, but, uh, uh, but it, I, I have faith and, and Sean has faith. It's all going to work out when we're done. And that's why I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to jinx anything. I don't want to do anything. We'll talk about it at the end. I got high hopes. So there you go. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Let me just tell you this funny. Okay. So there's a moderator here. Okay. This is the story I want to share with you. Um, and, um, I found this the other day. So I have these, um, uh, racks that I keep all these guitars in, right? Cause you know, there's just stuff here for all kinds of reasons. And, uh, in the rack was this gig bag. And I go, what is this gig bag? <laughs> and I look at it and it's got a tag on it. Now that's important because the tag is a repair tag and I don't do much repair anymore because obviously, uh, I'm making content and doing all the things or working with Badlands or doing this other stuff. I'm always on a project somewhere doing something, uh, or winding a pickup, right? You name it. And, uh, I go, it's a repair tag. And I look and I go, Hey, this is a customer's repair. And so I opened it and it's been so long, I didn't even remember what it is. And so here's what's funny. So this is the story. I'm, I'm telling it to be funny. Uh, so there's a moderator here, here, his name is unfreaking believable. Like two or three years ago, <laughs> if you know the answer, uh, I, I want to call him by his first name. I don't know if he tells people. Unfreaking, if you know the answer, um, put the answer. How long has it been here? So I go to I go to look at this guitar. So what happened was he brought me a guitar a few years ago. It's a Paul Reed Smith SE, and he had me uh, like trick it out. And he let me do whatever he wanted. He paid the parts. And I think I did the labor either reduced to really low or nothing. I can't remember. I think it was reduced really low. And uh, I said, okay. And then I think I told him to come get it. And then he never came and got it. And so when I saw it, I pulled it out and I go, this is really cool. So here's why the story's funny. I didn't go like, oh, he didn't pick up his guitar. I go, what is this really cool guitar? And I go, and then I go, does he know what it is? <laughs> so I'm going to share it to you guys. We're going to do a show and tell. This is unfreaking believable's guitar that he doesn't know. Ex- that apparently, this it's been here forever. Okay, so what it is, I'm going to show you the back. This is a Paul Reed Smith SE, uh, SE single cut. Okay, I just want to see which one. So obviously, he was that in cherry red. So he had me uh, make it better. So it's got a full setup. By the way, it's out of tune. <laughs> so, um, well, kind of in tune. Okay, so um, what I did to it. So what do I do? I redid the wiring in this guitar. So it's all new wiring. I did, uh, and uh, I upgraded his tuning keys. And I, I redid his nut. I did his fret work. I polished him. They... Trust me, they they, pa- they passed the sock test. I should have got a sock. Um, but I switched all his hardware to black because I thought black looked better with the black cherry. So on the headstock, what I did is it's got locking um, ratio tuning keys. These are the ones where each gear has a different ratio, right? So these are ratio locking tuning keys in black. And what's funny is I think this is a made in Korea one, right? Yeah, this is world manufacturing. 
And then I changed his hardtail out to black with the intonatable adjustment part right here. Let me show you that. Look at that. Look how good that looks. And I even did the bridge. You can see that the adjustment's a little bit glossier than this, which is which is what you want. Um, I, I kind of set it to where these pickle frames, and I actually got these really cool aftermarket pickle frames that are much, they're like the PRS ones where there's there's soft touch. And then, I don't know if you can see, but these are custom wound. See the pickups? They look like the screws look like, like they're different colors, like blue and copper. That's because these are custom wound Northern Lights that I made. I only made two sets. One went to a famous rock star. I'm not making this up, um, which he used. He sent me a really nice, amazing video of him playing it live. Uh, but sadly enough, uh, he bought them. So he's not letting me tell you. <laughs> I would have gladly given him a free to go, he's using my pickups, but he, he bought them. Um, luckily for me, uh, a friend of mine bought a set and he was friends with this great rock star guy. Um, and, uh, the rock star guy sent me an email going, Hey, make me a set. So I did. And, uh, I thought it was going to be like, Oh, he's going to, I'm going to make him a set. And then he'll be like, I use them too. Instead he paid me and which it's smart because <laughs> now he doesn't have to do promo. But anyways, his pickups, what he requested was black bobbins, but he wanted the pole pieces, different colors. So I did those for a few people. I actually, Michael Nielsen has a set that's like this where I did the the, the uh, screw pieces. Um, they're torch. I use a torch and I just like, um, just like bare knuckles will do. They use a torch and you cook the metal and basically get a change. So these are special custom pickups um, that you, so... There you go, with special satin bobbins. That's what was, was unique. So anyways, this is a really cool guitar. And so I just wanted to make fun of Unfreaking Believable because it's been sitting here for two years. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Tony says, is it Phil X? No, it's not Phil X. Uh, Phil X would, uh, would be probably cool enough to mention it publicly, you know, because to help me out, like it's a nice thing to do, right? Because we've had... a that kind of nice relationship. This is a uh, this is a, a, a guitar player who's really talented from the '80s. I don't know this person, right? Does it make sense? I know him because of you know the band he's in and stuff, but I don't know him personally. There's no connection that way. It's just he tried a set, he liked them, and he's like he wanted a set. So, um, so anyways, uh, unforgivable. <laughs> Oh, he goes, it was missing a, a tone knob because it broke. Oh yeah, and I replaced that too. Yeah, so it's got new new knobs. Look at that, speed knobs, look at that. What? Coil split, look at that. Um, so there you go. So on uh, Unfreaking Believable, if you ever want a really nice cherry red single cut PRS with cool black hardware and cool custom pickups, <laughs> you should uh, call or text Shauna or WhatsApp message her <laughs> and, uh, and get it. I'll meet you. <laughs> I'll bring it to you if I have time during the day. Sometimes I want to get out of the house and it works. So I just thought it'd be funny and share that to you guys. So like I said, um, all right. Uh, it was March, 2022. <laughs> so it's been a while. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, let's go to the next What's the next thing do we have? Do we have another subject? Are we are we done? We're late in the show. Hold on. We got Dumac. Dumac says, Phil, any thoughts on why Fender Squire has never done a telly in a strat body? So the way I'm reading this comment is you're saying why they've never done a it's a strat body, but with the telecaster bridge and pickups, like the telecaster style. Um you know, it's funny, I, you know, never say never. They probably do have one somewhere, some unique runoff and things. Because, um, you know, Fender is notorious uh, in Squire 2 for doing tons of limited things, uh, FSR, right? Special runs. And in those special runs, they can tell how well they do to see if that's something you do. Um, didn't they do that? Like they did the Pawn Shop series, right, guys? So there's something that's like that, right? The Pawn Shop series is a little bit of a hybro, you know, hybro. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess hybrid. <laughs> Hi, bro. Anyways, hybrid, <laughs> hybrid hardware. And uh, so, I mean, maybe there's something in that uh, thing that I don't specifically remember, but there was, yeah. So I mean, it says uh, paranormal Squire Nashville Strat. Like I said, I can't imagine they didn't do some version of that. Um, there's don't, don't worry if you didn't know about it. Cause I didn't know about it. You know, there's just too many things to keep up on. It's enough to, it just runs your mind ragged trying to figure it out. Right. Um, but 
interesting, right? Interesting. Um, to me, I mean, I, I guess if that's your appeal, you know, that you want that, you want to, you want a telly, but you want it to look like a strat. I have a telly, um, that is like a strat and then it has, well, and my GNL is like this too. Oops. Eh, right there. Um, I mean, it's dual humbucker, but I mean, it has a arm carve and a belly carve like a strat. And so to me, that's what I associate the strat to is the belly carve, arm carve comfort thing. Right. And then the telly shape is, I like the telly shape more. I just like the arm carve belly carve thing. So there you go. Um, <laughs> Brian says he's <laughs> that guitar is longer than a custom shop guitar. Yeah. Well, I think it is. It's long enough to where when I saw it, I was like, what the hell is this? Cause it's in, cause you gotta stand. I told you I'm doing a lot of content right now and I'm going through and like, I have like, Oh, this I have to do. And this has to go back. And this, you know, this ships back to the company and this is coming in. And then I'm like, what is this? And I'm like, why, why would PRS send me the, this, I couldn't figure it out. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Okay. Uh, Tess says, was the guitarist on the uh, uh, Rolling Stone 250 list? No. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I never really looked at the list. I assume not. I, the, 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 what I got from the list was there was a crap ton of cool guitar players listening, missing. So who knows? Um, okay. Let me go through and see if I can grab... Yeah, Wendell says the ratio locking tuners are nice. I love them. That's why I use them. Um, <laughs> uh, I like it when I get through the comments. Sometimes I'm like, uh, oh, so Unfreaking Blue says, I know. Remember, you were supposed to bring it to the Phoenix Guitar Show. Yeah, that would probably make sense. But that you're talking about last year? The um, Yeah, I don't know why we didn't do it. Then. Why didn't I bring it then? That would make sense. I should have brought it. So, um, but like I said, easy enough. We can we can get that rectified. And now you know. Or maybe now you don't want it. Now you're sitting there like, ah. Eh. But I was sitting there the whole time going, you know, so you guys know, I don't think I ever sent him anything other than just the parts, the pricing of the parts. I don't think I ever told him what we did to it. So. Uh, let's see. Oh, he says you forgot. Yeah, of course I forgot. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Um, does anyone have anything else? Should we call it? It'd be Okay, hold on a second. If you guys got something else, let me know. Um, hmm. All right. I think we're done. I think we called it. I don't want to. And I think on my tab, did I cover all the things during the week that was sent to us? I did. Right. We talked about pickups. We talked about the stuff going on. We talked about the Delos uh, guitar. We talked about the questions. We talked about the giveaway for the snarks. So, yeah, we did it. So I want to thank you guys so much uh, for hanging out as always. This was great. Um, unless I can find something else. Otherwise, we'll call it. Okay, hold on a second. Yeah, somebody says, why don't you end the show doing the top 10 for Rolling Stone magazine? No. <laughs> like I said, then I'm falling for their crap. Like I said, I think that's what they're up to. Uh, Hero Glop says, why does Guild have such a low presence in YouTube and demos? And we know what the answer is. They might have a bigger presence on the acoustic channels. That's possible. But uh, in my, like I said, in my experience, if you look at my channel, if I did only what companies sent, it would be I would be doing like five videos all the time. Companies get used to working with certain channels and they send them the same stuff all the time. That's why you keep seeing the same stuff on certain channels all the time. Um, and... Uh, you know, and then some companies don't send anything out for review or for, you know, they don't do any kind of co-sponsoring or anything like that. There's just nothing like that out there. Um, and 
that's why we kind of go, you know, hey, what do you guys want to see? And then we 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 get it, right? Um, like I said, Fender Squire doesn't work with the channel in any way, but I do a lot of Squire and Fender because we just buy them and put them on the channel, or we figure out a different way to get them on the channel because you guys are interested in them. And same thing with Epiphone Gibson, they don't work with the channel in any way. So um, I try to do as many Epiphone Gibson videos. Like I said, I try to keep it comparatively, but like you as you guys obviously can see, PRS will send product out. So with PRS sending product out. We don't have to work too hard to get PRS. It's just here. They ship it. Um, and uh, we don't do any soliciting, as I told you. We don't reach out to any companies for anything. Um, so, like I said, some things, uh, you know. And um, in, my, in my personal experience, which is apparently seems to be different than most channels, and I don't know if that's me or, like I said, either, either I'm, I'm doing something wrong, which is fine, or the channels are somehow not, they're, you know, they're not telling the truth. I'm not sure what the answer is. But here's what I've kind of learned. Um, most of the companies that work with my channel, it doesn't matter how, how well the video does. It has to do with what I say in the video that seems to have the effect. So tons of companies that have reached out in the past, they've sent product. And here's why I say that. Uh, I've, I have videos. Look, I just recently have done videos with Schecter guitars, as you guys know. I bought those Schecter guitars and I put them on the channel. Why? I don't know. I sent emails to Schecter responding to them after I did the, the videos. They sent me some guitars. I did the videos. The videos all did seven figure numbers and resulted in what seemed to be a positive net positive result, but they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't respond, you know, so, and they didn't send anything else out ever again. So I don't know, you know, what, why that is. Uh, I have been told by other people in the industry that some people just don't like you critiquing things. It's the critique. Um, and then other YouTube channels will say, I can say, they say whatever they want and the companies don't care. So I don't know uh, what the real answer is. I just know this. If we want it on the channel, if you want it on the channel, you bring it up here. You can become a patron and help support it that way. You can do it absolutely free and not support the channel just by bringing it up here, putting in the comments, putting it in the comments in the videos. Like in my next video, Put a comment, it helps the video. Put a comment saying, hey, I wanna see this product. I wanna see this. Why don't you do a product about that? I bought a Rickenbacker, I put that on the channel. You know, I if I can find a reason to buy it, if I can find a logic to do it on the channel, I'll, I'll do it. it. It's it's a gear channel uh, in a perfect world. Um, I told you in a perfect world, I would figure out how to, I wanted to figure out what work with a retailer and then just basically have like a smorgasbord of product and anything you guys asked for, I would get. What I learned is all the retailers I work with essentially are no different than the companies I work with, which is they just want you to really focus on the thing that they need to sell. And you guys don't necessarily aren't interested in the thing they want to sell. <laughs> so, um, and there's a other downside is I see it constantly with companies. And again, not all companies are like this, but you, you reach out to a company and you go, Hey, I'd like to talk about your product. And they go, okay, this one product we're having trouble No one's bought one in 10 years. We want to send that to you. And you're like, well, no one's interested in that. And that's what they need promotion on. So it's just how it works. Um, you know, it's, it's how it works. So like I said, if you want, uh, if you want content on the channel, you just ask for it. Uh, we'll gladly do it. I don't have any, I have no companies that are blacked out. Like I said, whether I don't get along with them or whether I don't like them or whether I love them or whether I've never heard them, there's no company that's blacked out. If you're interested in seeing that product, uh, and having a discussion about it, I think those are the best videos. Um, you know, I like, I like seeing that you guys are like enjoying it. So Guild is a perfect example. If you want to see Guild on the channel, you just mentioned it. If you guys continue to mention that brand, if I see that same stuff coming up, I'll make sure it happens. So if I can find an excuse to do it, uh, like I said, if I can use the Patreon funds to do it, that's great. If I can find an excuse to do it on my own, I'll do it. Um, you know, I'd already told you the history with me and Spark, but you guys constantly ask me about the Spark Mini or Micro and the Spark Go. And so I was like, hey, I have an opportunity. Why don't I buy a Spark Go and, and, and see how it is. Like, see if I can, you know, enjoy it. Check it out. So there you go. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how to say that. It's L-E-T-H, but it's this big space. Uh, says guilds are sweet. I've owned guilds in the past. I was a guild dealer, dealer but I was a guild, guild dealer when Fender owned them. The Fender no longer owns them. I don't even think, uh, who owns them now? I don't even know if anyone knows. It was Cordoba, but I don't even know if they still own them. I thought they sold them off too, so I have no idea. I have no idea. So, 
Yeah. So Steve says, I'd like to see a guild on the channel. Yeah. Like I said, Gretch, perfect example. Like I said, um, just let me know. Like I said, in the comments like this, it's a perfect way to get the stuff on the channel. Um, it's, uh, it's always nets a lot of views and it seems a great excitement when it's something you guys are interested in. So there you go. All right. Uh, Lee Asbury, let's just play some, let's have a couple, because it's so early, let's have a couple, let's take a minute and do some fun questions. Lee says, I want to change the screw pole pieces on my SE humbuckers to gold. Is there anything I should know? Uh, I got a gold pick. I got gold pickup screws from Stumac. No, nope, there's nothing you really should know. Don't be concerned. Um, when you unscrew the screws out of the humbucker, you may see the wax come out, right? Um, cause there's wax if they're potted in there. Um, don't worry about that. It's not as significant. The wax is for the, uh, the, the wire, the windings. That's what it's, what it's doing is it's solidifying the wire. So the wire doesn't vibrate, which is what causes the feedback. That's what they're doing with the wax. That's why we wax pot pickups. And because if you don't wax pot, the pickups, um, when the guitar vibrates, <laughs> the uh, the uh, the wire, the the um, pickup wire vibrates, and then that causes feedback. Um, so that's why they wax pot it. Um, so basically, when you pull the screw out, you'll see wax. You don't have to do anything; just throw that away. It's fine, and put the new screws in. You'll be absolutely fine. Because um, they just when we wax pot pickups, we just get wax everywhere. It's just how it works. Um, and then that may start a second question when somebody always at, will ask. I can hear it in my head now. Well, why do some pickups don't have wax potting? It's because originally they didn't. Right. Uh, there's all kinds of all kinds of uh, legends out there and stories. Uh, EVH himself, Eddie Van Halen, uh, stated he was the first one to ever wax, peta, wax pot a pickup. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I've never done the research. I don't know who's who's the original person, but I just know at some point they started wax potting pickups to fix the problem. Um, and the originals didn't. And so people get into this thing like, Again, look, if there's tone wood, there's tone wax. Of course there's tone wax, <laughs> right? Of course. Oh, wax pot. I have no idea. I would never, so you know, I would never commit any of my mind or time to the concept of checking to be uh, wax potted versus not wax potted. I, my guess is, here's my guess. My guess is if you A, B them closely, there's some kind of difference because everything, every component is going to have some effect on the overall sum of what's happening. But I don't want to feedback, <laughs> so I don't care, right? It's kind of like one of those things, right? It's, it's, uh, I would rather not have the amp just blaring feedback in my ears, uh, than, than going, wow, without wax potting, yeah, it feeds back, but I get 1% more high frequency response. I don't know. So, uh, Dougal Dog says the Washburn is an N2. No, I think, uh, no, that is an N4. So, you know, that's an N4. Um, I have two N4s. I have the swirled one and I have this one right there. Um, I have that N4 because I had a bunch of stuff that I didn't want. <laughs> and so I went to a store and I said, and I walked around and I saw a brand new N4. Uh, and I said, hey, I'll give you all this stuff for that. And they said, okay. And so um, that's how I like to do trades on the, on the, I accumulate a bunch of stuff and I'm like, I'm not using it. And I go, how do I turn this small stuff I'm not using into something really cool that normally I would not write the check for. And it doesn't feel as expensive to me. <laughs> that's gear math. <laughs> that's gear math on another level. That's like, if I trade for it, I didn't really spend the money. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's nice. Okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah. Uh, Volk Hammer says Eddie Van Halen claims he was the first to wax pack pickups. I thought I saw, yeah. I, I mean, I've not read articles too, but I thought he said that when he was at like the Smithsonian and doing stuff like that. So, you know, who, who knows? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. I just, I really just, what, what it does is really what matters to me. Okay. Um, Uh, let's see. Oh, Angry Pickle. <laughs> That's a funny name. I love it. it. says, so if you're playing outdoors in the summer in Texas, can your pots melt? Um, so you're saying pots. I think obviously the pots won't melt, but if your question, which I'm going to morph it a little bit to where I think you're actually going is, will the wax potted pickups melt if they're in the heat? Um, 
they can, it get, you know, obviously, you know, you got to look at the melting temperature of wax, but it's not just that easy. So for instance, if you left your guitar in a car in the middle of summer in Texas and Arizona, you know, somewhere where it's really hot, um, and it was not in sunlight, would it melt? They could, it would, it would, they would get soft. The wax would get super soft and it probably wouldn't move. And then of course, once it cooled down, it would solidify again and you'd probably be fine. Um, but over time it could like, you know, start pooling towards the bottom. However, indirect sunlight, absolutely. When the heat really cooks it up. So yeah, um, it's happened. I've actually had to re-wax pot pickups and do all kinds of stuff because they left it on stage during the day and they were playing a show and the sun was hitting the front of the guitar. I'm pretty sure that's how I met Nathan. So you guys know Nathan, um, uh, you know, who, who works for Fender now and, and we used to work PRS and work, work for me. Um, I'm pretty sure that's how I met Nathan. He came on my shop because his Gretsch, he had had it on a day show and the sun hit the pickups and the wax not only melted all the pickups and ran down the front of the guitar. He didn't know what it was. I think I can't remember exactly what the problem was. I just remember he's like, this is all my, my wax melted. And I was like, yeah, that does that. It's hot. <laughs> Uh, he was from California. So he was like, what the hell's going on? I'm like, yeah, it's the desert and it's, so uh, it's paraffin wax. So yes. So yes, your, your pickups can, uh, melt. Um, so, so there you, there you go. Uh, uh, so, um, I don't know. Abaga, Abo, Abo, Abobaga, Abaganasi fail, man, I'm messing up your name. Says the guitar pickup, uh, potted is wax mixture is about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah, so you can imagine it can get that hot in a car here. However, what I've learned is it's not just the temperature, right? It's, it's the car can get 150, but the, like I said, the wax, it doesn't just liquefy at, at that temperature in the car. And maybe the car doesn't get 140. Maybe the car only gets 120 to 130. I hear all kinds of things. You'd have to check here in Arizona. I'm sure it can get insanely hot in a car, just like a lot of places, but it's so, um, Okay, we'll end. Uh, uh, Miss, Miss, Mr. S says uh, CEOs are overpaid, creepy, Adderall, <laughs> uh, narcissist, Fender CEO can kick rocks, love the Schecter, keep rocking. Yeah, like I said, it's, um, it's, it's, I don't disagree. <laughs> How about that? Okay, on that note, we're going to button it up. Um, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Uh, look for some content. I have some really interesting content coming that I'm excited for. And then, of course, just some standard guitar review content. Um, hopefully, I'll also have that new uh, fret file. I think that's a big deal because the Music Nomad fret file is uh, like claiming to be the next greatest thing in fret in dress files. And as you guys know, I'm a huge, huge... Uh, if there's one, like one of my favorite products from Stumac ever, it's their fret in dress file. So I'm really curious to compare the two and see what I think of them. Um, and see how they compare. So I'll let you know uh, what I think of it. So, all right. On that note, you guys have an amazing weekend. And, uh, oh, check this out. I can do this. The Know Your Gear podcast. Ah! All right. You guys have an amazing weekend and play guitar. <laughs>